Okay, try to recall briefly what we talked about last time uh, related to wing bending. We discussed the role of thickness and how that affects uh, bending weight. Um, and we talked about the lift distribution. So we primarily focused on uh, the wing and the primary, often the primary structural load consideration of bending. Of course, to analyze an aircraft structure, we gotta think about a lot more operating conditions, uh, structural failure modes, we won't go through all of those, obviously, but we are going to talk a little bit about uh, some flight envelopes that help us to understand the range of, say, load cases that we should look at. Not, not the individual structural load cases, but, uh, say, flight conditions, maybe a better way to say it. Okay, so I, I, uh, there are two um, diagrams we'll talk about, and we'll split this up into two videos just to keep it uh, a little more compartmentalized. So first, we're going to talk about uh, flight envelope. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Um, and this flight envelope, it goes, it's gone by many names. Um, we've seen it as a placard diagram, doghouse plot, sometimes just a flight envelope. Um, we'll just call it that for simplicity. Um, so to motivate this, I'd like you to, to give some thought. Let's uh, draw a plot here. Around the x-axis, we will have speed. Okay, we'll just call this speed. Okay, and on the y-axis, oops, um, this will be our altitude. Okay. And when you uh, design an airplane, let's say we designed it, you know, for some given, this is our, it's typical operating condition, let's say in cruise. But of course, we know an airplane isn't going to only operate um, at one condition. And so the question is, what are our limits? And we need to make sure our aircraft is going to be structurally sound within this whole envelope of things. So the question I want to pose first for you to give some thought to, uh, let's say I go these different directions, right? What, what are, and, and you may not know what the curves look like, but you can think physically, what prevents me from going, say, really far to the right or really far to the left, really up, far up? What are the physical limitations to my airplane they're gonna create some bounds on uh, uh, my flight envelope. Okay, so pause and give that some thought. Okay, so some things you may think about. Um, let's first discuss this low end. This is something we've discussed quite a bit. As I go slower and slower, what is going to prevent me uh, from going, you know, all the way down to zero? Well, we've talked about stall, uh, so let's just write that down without uh, drawing anything, stall. Okay, so we know at some point I'm going to stall and the speed that I stall at uh, is not gonna be the same at every altitude, right? Because the density is changing. So there's gonna be some curve that's going to change. Not, it's not gonna just be a straight line because the stall speed is different, but there's stall over there on the left, okay? What about on the right? What's preventing me to go too far to the right? Well, the big one is uh, the structure, right? So as I go faster and faster, my dynamic pressure increases. Now remember what dynamic pressure is. This is a, let's call it dynamic pressure. One half rho V squared. So as I go faster and faster, uh, I'm gonna have higher structural loadings, right? The distributions, lift distributions and so on are going to increase. And so at some point, I'm going to hit my structural limit. And because density is changing, again, as I change altitude, uh, let's say I have some max dynamic pressure. Well, that means that the speed I can fly at is going to be uh, faster at low densities and smaller at high densities, right? So it's, again, not going to be a straight line, um, but it's going to be some sort of curve. Okay, so going down, obviously, I, I need to be able to go down to the ground. Um, there's nothing necessarily limiting me there. Actually, the other thing that's potentially limiting me up on this high end is my Mach number. So even if my structure can withstand the loads, my Mach number may be too high to where I get really large compressibility drag. So let's write that as well. Um, say high Mach number for compressibility. Okay, so that depends on your airplane, right? If it's not one that flies a high Mach number, that won't limit you. But uh, if it's a large transport aircraft, right, we're going to hit some sort of uh, 
ceiling where the drag gets too high. Okay, then uh, what about going up? What's the problem there? Well, typically it's a propulsion system. The density becomes uh, too low for us to support a propulsion system. Um, in our analysis, we're not gonna really go through too much detail there. We're gonna have that be a given, but it's called the ceiling. So again, we usually use a more detailed propulsion analysis, but we'll figure out a ceiling. That's the altitude that we can't exceed. Okay, so um, let's, uh, uh, before we try to construct this diagram in, in more detail, there's just a few different types of airspeed that we need to review, because here on the axis, I wrote speed, but there are actually many different types of speed that we could uh, use. So uh, again, just pause for a second and think about what are some different types of speed that might be of interest to an aircraft. Okay, so um, one you might think of, uh, and let's see, I don't know which order, well, it doesn't matter, let's just do the ground speed first. So ground speed, that's what it sounds like, that's just the speed relative to the ground, okay? And so I care about that if I need to track, you know, how long it's gonna take me to get from point A to point B, I, I care about on the ground, right? I care about that speed relative to the ground. That's not the same thing as, uh, might necessarily need my air speed, um, and we'll be a little more careful because there's different air speeds. We'll use, the first one we'll talk about is what's called true air speed. Okay, so this is the speed of the aircraft relative to the air. This is what, when, whenever we've said V infinity, this is what that is. This is what the aerodynamicist usually cares about. Just to give you an example, let's say, uh, so if there was no wind, then true air speed and ground speed would be the same, right? If I was flying it, uh, 100 meters per second, true airspeed, and there was no wind, that would be the same as over ground, right? But, but if I have wind, let's say, um, let's say my airplane here, right, is uh, uh, there's a 10 meter per second wind, um, and I'm moving relative to the ground at 90 meters per second. Well, my true airspeed is 100 meters per second because I've got the 90 meters per second on the ground, but the wind is coming in at 10 meters per second. So my true airspeed is actually faster. So just to make that, you know, and to give you some extreme cases here, let's take a small airplane, like a small UAV that you might be flying. Let's say that um, I had a 10 meters per second wind speed, then my ground speed could actually be zero, right? Could be not moving relative to the ground because this wind is coming so fast. My airspeed is still 10 meters per second, but the ground speed is zero. Conversely, I could have a tailwind where, let's say there's a tailwind of 10 meters per second. My ground speed was 10 meters per second, uh, or, or actually my ground speed was 20 meters per second, even though my airspeed was only 10 meters per second. So, uh, you know, think about, you can think about those different cases, but again, the main difference here is, is the wind, right? That, uh, between the true airspeed and, and the ground speed. So again, as aerodynamicists, is what we care about the true airspeed, that's what's gonna affect uh, the loads on the airplane aerodynamic loads. But the ground speed, of course, is what determines, you know, how fast I'm actually getting somewhere on the ground. And for a large airplane that's going really fast, of course, these usually aren't that different, but for a small airplane, these, these could be quite different. Okay, so another important airspeed is what's called the equivalent airspeed. Oops, equivalent airspeed. Okay, and the reason for this, um, is that, remember in the last slide we talked about uh, dynamic pressure. Dynamic pressure is what we care about because that's what really is affecting my loading, right? It's this pressure. It's not the speed per se, it's dynamic pressure. So my structure, I could do all my sizing and say, I can get up to you know, this limit. I can tell you what Q max is gonna be. My structure can't take anything above that, okay? I didn't say what speed it was because it's not actually the speed that matters. It's that pressure, the dynamic pressure. So, uh, it's useful to have what's called an equivalent airspeed where we keep things at a constant dynamic pressure. So in words, this would be the airspeed um, at sea level, uh, and there's nothing special about sea level, it's just a helpful reference point, um, with equivalent dynamic pressure, okay? So if I took whatever dynamic pressure I was experiencing and I said, okay, what would be my speed at sea level that corresponded to the same dynamic pressure? So in other words, as an equation form, we would say one half uh, 
Well, that's not a half. One half dynamic pressure, right? One half rho, and I would write true airspeed. Okay, so this this is our V infinity. I'm just going to write T A S true airspeed. Okay, so that's the dynamic pressure that I'm actually experiencing. My equivalent airspeed then would be what speed would I have to fly at sea level? So we'll use the density of sea level, and this quantity here is called equivalent airspeed. Okay, so if I solve for that, I could say equivalent airspeed is true airspeed times the square root of rho, 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 sea level. All right, so again, all it tells me is that this is my actual dynamic pressure I'm flying at. What's the equivalent speed at sea level that would give me the same dynamic pressure? And the reason why this is useful is that we can then, say, create tables or charts in terms of equivalent airspeed, then we don't have to worry about altitude because that applies at any altitude. It's really another way to say dynamic pressure, okay, but just converted to a, a speed. It's not a necessary, necessarily a real speed. It's, again, you can maybe think of it more as a dynamic pressure expressed in terms of a speed. Okay, so that's equivalent airspeed. Um, there are two more uh, that are used. I'm gonna write them all out here. It's not in detail, but just to explain them. These are less common. These are the ones we talked about are the most important. Um, the first is what's called indicated airspeed, IAS, indicated airspeed. So all this is, is uh, it's the difference. So remember from, let's say, an incompressible, uh, you know, your beginning fluids class, you might have looked at something like a pitot tube, right? So here's a pitot tube, and the air comes in, it's going to stagnate, that's going to measure your total pressure, then you have a pressure tap here, and that's going to measure your static pressure, and for an incompressible fluid, low speeds, right, we can relate those, and the difference is just the dynamic pressure. So if I measure total pressure and static pressure, I can directly measure my dynamic pressure, and if I know the density, right, then I know my speed, okay? And so indicated airspeed really is what comes from this equation. It's just a simple difference in total pressure and static pressure. Um, the reason why this is useful is that we can calibrate a mechanical device that so doesn't need any electronics so that we can assess what this uh, speed is just from a mechanical difference in pressure. Um, there are, of course, some problems with that. Uh, you know, this, uh, th there's some instrumentation errors, right? Because the, the pressure, the pitot tube is not going to be exactly aligned with my, our speed, right? Because it's going to be mounted on the airplane. So there's some instrumentation errors and things. Uh, so we often need to calibrate this. And then this is what's called uh, the calibrated airspeed. Um, and so this is just, uh, let's just say, some corrections for instrumentation and things. Um, the other problem is with this measurement, though, is that uh, this totally fails for a compressible flow. At low speeds, well, I shouldn't say this totally fails. The PO tube still makes sense. This equation is not correct. This is only true for low speeds, or in other words, incompressible flow. If the flow is compressible, I can still measure speed or Mach number from uh, differences in my total pressure um, and pressure. So I can get a dynamic pressure actually from these two. But the formula is, is not a difference. It's, it's a more complicated expression. Uh, you can see it in the text if you're interested. But this then becomes what's called equivalent airspeed, which we just talked about. So we added a compressibility correction. And of course, uh, you know, we, we may need a, a digital you know, airspeed, in, uh, airspeed measurement device to figure this out. Um, then equivalent airspeed to true airspeed. We already discussed that. Uh, the difference there is that we went from um, local air density instead of just using some equivalent speed. We're actually using what the actual air density is to get our actual speed at that altitude. And then to get to ground speed, um, we then are using the local wind. Right? So that includes wind. Again, these last three are really the most important for us. Um, these others may be more for pilots. Okay, uh, so with that background, which speed do you think we should use here on the x-axis? Which do you think will be most helpful in constructing this plot? It's not necessarily a right choice, but uh, you can think about that. Okay, so what's often used, and it's going to differ from the other diagram we're going to use. In fact, actually there's many ways you could do it, but we're going to use true airspeed because that's what we're used to thinking about. 
in a second, we're going to actually, in a different diagram, um, we're going to look at a, a different quantity. But for now, let's just look at it in terms of true airspeed. Okay, so let's say, um, uh, I'm not going to put units because it's just going to be a notional diagram, and then this will be our altitude. Okay, so uh, remember that on the right side, we said structure is going to be a problem. So we just wrote that, um, let's let me write it over here. Uh, let's let's uh, pick a color here. One half rho true airspeed squared equals one half rho sea level uh, equivalent airspeed squared. And we know that our structure is going to give us some constant dynamic pressure. You could think of it either as equivalent airspeed, or we could just say, we're going to get some Q max. This is going to be some known constant. That's a function of our airplane. So you can see if I solve for true airspeed, it's going to look like some sort of square root function. Uh, it's going to look something like this. Right? So this is going to be, um, we could say constant Q or constant yeah, yeah, so that's my structure. It's limiting how fast I can go. If I go past that, right, that's going to be a problem for my structure because it wasn't designed to carry that high of a dynamic pressure. Um, another uh, one that's simpler is that we said there's a ceiling. That's just going to be an altitude. We're not going to do that analysis, but we're going to say that's a given here from the propulsion system. Um, and so this red curve, I could keep drawing it, right? It's going to intersect somewhere. Maybe I should draw it a little better because it's not going to curve quite that way. Well, it may, but I don't want to draw forever. So let's say it goes up to like that. Okay. Um, on this high end, though, we also said Mach number could be a problem. Okay. Remember compressibility. It may be that I hit compressibility limits before I hit my structural limit. Um, so if I that, that's going to give me say a constant Mach number. It's going to be or actually let me write this way a maximum Mach number that I can't exceed. And remember, Mach number is just a ratio of my speed, my true air speed, divided by speed of sound. And speed of sound is a function of temperature. So at high altitudes, if I was in the isothermal region, this is going to be a straight line. Okay, I'll call this constant Mach. But at some point, if I drop below the isothermal region, then the temperature is increasing towards the ground. So what does that do to my Mach number? If the temperature increases as I get lower, the speed of sound also increases. That means for a constant Mach number, um, I could actually fly faster before I hit that Mach number limit. So this curve is actually going to start bending away like this. Okay. So that's a compressibility limit. Um, and then on the left side, we talked about stall, right? So uh, that's just, you know, we just go back to seal max, the definition of seal max, if you remember. Um, on the equation, uh, let's see, CL equals uh, lift over one half rho V squared times an area. And I could solve this for V. That's going to be the square root. And if I'm at steady level flight, uh, 2 W, let's see if I'm doing this right, rho CL over S ref. And if I want the smallest, the stall speed, then I need to make CL the biggest, CL max. Okay. So Given those quantities, um, I guess I should have put this in terms of an altitude. Uh, actually, let me just, yeah, I'll just keep it like that, it's fine. But you can see there's gonna be a relationship between uh, my speed, the stall speed I can get to, the minimum speed, and density, because that's the thing that's gonna change with altitude. So you're gonna have to calculate that. Uh, we can use those equations we talked about from chapter one, right, the, uh, of density versus altitude. I'm going to get some sort of limit that's going to look something like this. Okay, and this is stall. Um, the density, what happens as I go to higher altitudes? Well, my density uh, decreases. So if my density decreases, you can see in this equation here that my stall speed is going to increase. Uh, so that's why this curve, this curve is going to shift towards the right. And so this area that's bounded in these curves here, right, that's going to be my flight envelope. I can't exceed. Uh, uh, anything outside of this. And again, if you you don't have an airplane that flies at high Mach numbers, then you may not have this portion here, right? It may go out to here before that, uh, before that intersected. Okay, uh, so 
that's going to be the first section. Next, we're going to talk about um, another type of diagram, but we'll save that for a separate video.